Hey, what is up guys? It's your boy Speed here, and today we're going to be taking a look at a match between Gaming Gladiators and Namiga, but uh, <laughs> that name is so weird. But basically, instead of going through one player in specific, I'm going to be looking at four plays that Gaming Gladiators makes that I think are really high skill. So hopefully you can take a lot out of these examples and implement them into your matches. Also, I want to tell you guys that if you've been struggling with solo queue and you're looking to get to the next rank, I'm going to be able to help you. Like literally with the Game Leap website, I'm going to give you guys guides that are going to make it unbelievably clear on what you need to do. So if you've been stuck in the solo queue grind, you don't know what to do and you want to become absolutely broken. <laughs> but like actually you want to become much, much better at Dota and you want to take it more seriously, the Game Leap website is going to help you do that. So click the link down below. I'm going to help you get to the next rank and I'll see you there. So the first major play that I really liked from Gaming Gladiators is a Roshan attempt they make at minute 22, which or minute 22, 30, that goes extremely smoothly. Honestly, to the point where I'm like, how do they have so much confidence walking into this pit? So I wanted to take a look at what causes them to do it because the enemy team was not dead and you can't argue that, oh, you know, they don't have their cooldowns because they have Nova, they have Ravage, they don't have Stone Gaze, but I think you can kind of deal with that so why are they forcing the fight or why are they taking Roshan? I think the main reason why they're taking Roshan here is honestly the fact that they feel strong. I think that's number one. And that's always something to think about when, you know, you're getting into the mid game. Are we the stronger team? If you are, Roshan is the best objective because it's likely going to either force a fight or just give you a second life. However, another thing that I like is kind of what they saw 30 seconds ago. And this should also largely influence you to Roche, which is a major core bottom. They see this Medusa bottom and they know it's going to take a long time for her to be able to connect to the pit. And so using that gap, right, understanding that knowledge, that's also another reason why they can Roche. And that's exactly what they do. Clears up a couple camps on the Faceless Void. And once they get a little bit of a read that the enemy isn't actually Roching, especially here when they see the Phoenix TP top, it's kind of a dead giveaway. Like, why would the enemy support TP top if they were going to try to smoke and contest Roche? you wouldn't do that. Now, even in your average pub, people just usually will show all around the map. If you see two or three heroes completely across the map from Roshan, you should really try your best to make the call and get Aegis. So the next play I really like from Gaming Gladiators is how they push their advantage. Currently, we're playing off the same Aegis we just looked at, and this is your major advantage. I think they also feel that they're just a stronger team right now, right? They have a mega farm faceless void. It's very hard for the enemy team to fight them. So what are they going to do? How are they going to play around this? Well, they know the enemy team is likely to dodge them. Now, to be honest, in your average pub, if you're winning, the enemy team will probably fight you. All you have to do in that case is just not walk up and hit the tower when five heroes are defending the tower. That's actually what often happens in pubs. People just YOLO at a tower. This is the exact opposite, where no one on the side of Namiga defends the tower, and he knows that's probably going to be the case, and so he just takes it from full. And the most important part to this is the fact that his team kind of just rotates across the map. You're going to see they don't sit behind him. They make the read. It's a very advanced read. They stay in the area for a little bit, but once they get this information or this feeling that, okay, the void is fine. He's going to be able to take the tower from full and he does take the tower from full. They can look to shift across the map. They also see that the Ench is here. They get a pick off on Ench and the Vat Rider and the Rubik now sweep into the triangle and look for a kill and they end up finding a really nice tight under kill. So that's something to keep in mind. If the enemy team decides to not defend the tower, you can try to leave your carry there alone with Aegis and he can TP into the fight. In this case, it's TPing in for a pickoff. I think Naminga does a pretty good job here of just splitting up the map and avoiding a major team fight when they're certainly losing the game. The next thing that I love from gaming gladiators here is the itemization. There's a couple things that I think are actually quite funny. So the item build we see on the Magnus and the Rubik are going to be very similar. The Magnus is about to complete an Aether Lens that's largely to help him blink further for better RPs, skewer people from further, and also cast Heaven's Halberd on the Medusa, right? Their team comp, Namiga's team comp, largely almost solely revolves around the Medusa's damage at this point. Tide does practically no damage. Phoenix is actually pretty good, but the Tusk core went BKB blink, quite defensive, and this Ench is just a support. At this point, she doesn't have a D-Lance. She's not crushing anyone with damage. It's 31 minutes into the game. So understanding this, they itemize for this timing. The Rubik is picking up a Halberd, making him extraordinarily tanky and very good against this um, this Medusa. He'll never die to the Tusk initiation because of the fact that he has Assange and Evasion. And so now they just have completely countered out this Medusa. 
And I think in a lot of games, obviously you can't just go a bunch of halberds, but it's very important when the game starts, when you're in the loading phase, to identify what is the enemy team's win condition and what damage type do they primarily consist of. In this game, I don't think you could really pick one or the other. They don't have like particularly large amounts of physical or magical. I would say they're somewhat in between. So like it's a well-rounded draft on the side of an Omega. However, they have a hyper core. And so if the game scales, if the game goes mid to late, you can itemize to shut down that hyper core and we'll see that happen in the upcoming fights. And sort of on the same point, I think in terms of teamfight execution, it's also just as important to identify what is the win condition for the enemy team. Sometimes it's not very clear, I'm not gonna lie. However, mid to late game, often it is gonna revolve around a carry. And so you wanna make sure you kite out that carry with four staffs, glimmer caves, or just your spells. In this game, of course, it's the Medusa. And so they're gonna commit their load. They're gonna blow their entire load on the Medusa. And that's exactly what they wanna do. They go for the lasso. They're gonna follow it up with the RP. Uh, they BKB on the void to make sure he can't get stunned. Then he even Kronos. <laughs> so they just completely drop everything to take out this Medusa, but there's no damage afterwards. Once Medusa dies, the enemy team literally cannot do anything. And so they didn't even need the Halberds in this case. And finally, for our last clip of the video, I want to pay attention to the mid laner of Gaming Gladiators, CCNC, North American Bride. But basically, I really like how he executes this fight. I think it's very, very important to note how he approaches the fight and what he does to start the fight. So a lot of players have this bad intuition or this bad habit of not being in a position to camp wards and then jump the support that's going to try to deward the ward. Very often in the mid to late game, people underestimate or undervalue uh, the effectiveness of observer wards, especially during the nighttime, right? From the periods of 25 to 30, 35 to 40, 45 to 50, during these periods of the game in the nighttime, observer wards are the game. You can't let them get deworded casually. If you do, you'll likely run out and never see anything on the map. You're probably gonna get jumped and die. So what Quinn does here is he understands the value of this ops. The Ench, being a position five player, understands the value of the hill. They need to, when this Roshan is up, control this hill. And so Quinn understands that they're gonna be looking to do this. He's going to jump the Centaur, kill that with just one hit of the Witchblade and a sticky Napalm stack, and drag over the Ench and take the kill. Even though you might be like, oh, now he has used Lasso on the Ench, surely that's not good. First of all, it's fine, right? This Ench does do stuff in the teamfight, but most importantly, it protects the ward. Now that the ward doesn't go down, they can easily kite around it, and the supports will stay safe. The Magnus can probably get a good jump as well. This is also a pretty crazy play from Celery. He gets off the Snowball and then steals Ravage on the Rubik after coming out of the snowball pretty crazy and gets it off too <laughs> as they try to follow it up with the skewer um but yeah from ccnc's perspective he has to kite out a little bit here he sort of knows that his spells are on cooldown he pops his bkb defensively in this case and eventually the firefly will come up as he drops the flame break and then is going to kill off the medusa as they focus down the medusa so yeah main thing there is just protect your wards guys i, I know it seems like a small deal and a lot of people like when they watch videos like this and they hear the videos like this they kind of just dismiss it they're like i know right you might know but are you actually doing it and are you doing it consistently and if you're playing the initiator are you actively jumping heroes around wards because that's going to set up for just good fights overall like that's just a great habit to get into even if you're not a stun maybe you're a blink from anti mage maybe you're just a blink dagger hero in general whatever it is look to play the wards in the nighttime it's going to make a big difference in the fights and it's going to make sure you don't overextend uh for instance a lot of people just dive high ground and th that's like horrible fight selection that is the opposite of what I'm trying to teach you with this final point. And all right, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. And I'm out. Peace. And that's all. But remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below. And I'm out. Peace.